Hello and welcome to today's IWCS webinar. Now I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to Ed Fitton, your IWCS moderator. Ed, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Connie. Our IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the International Cable and Connectivity Symposium. I am Ed Fenton, a cable industry advisor working with the IWCS team. As Connie said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen to post a question anonymously, including during the presentation, if you wish. If you wish to contact the presenter or IWCS after the presentation, you will be given the contact points at the end of the webinar. Please note that IWCS does not distribute the presentation slides from either our conference sessions or these webinars. However, please feel free to contact the presenter directly and they will respond individually to you. Today, we welcome Ken Cornelison, industry consultant for Hitachi Cable America in New Hampshire, United States, who will be presenting his paper on CW and EFT noise coupling to category cables and the effect on one gigabit per second ethernet traffic. Ken Cornelison is an industry consultant with experience in the design, development, and testing of a wide range of copper and fiber optic cables and processes. He was graduated from Rose Holman Institute of Technology with a BSEE in electrical engineering and from Ball State University with an MBA. He has also worked with cable high frequency testing and monitoring equipment and developed new equipment useful for twisted pair cable process control. His most recent experience is in the design and development of new category cables with enhanced performance. Ken, we welcome you to present at today's IWCS webinar series event. Ken, thank you very much. And uh, host, uh, you can hear me? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, for the audience, just making sure the technical difficulties are squared away. Uh, again, thank you all for joining in this uh, presentation today, and I appreciate, you, uh, part appreciate your participation. Uh, today is all about uh, doing some EFT and CW testing on gigabit cable. And uh, one of the concerns that uh, is being addressed in this paper is trying to maintain consistent data through the uh, adverse electrical environments. And although there's 10 gigabit alien crosstalk requirements and all uh, several factors of you know, concern in 10 gigabit system or, or even higher, uh, there is still some uh, uh, investigations that seem to make sense to look at gigabit Ethernet traffic, even though it's been around for quite a number of years. The uh, MICE environments, which is a measure or a, or, a, or a standard, as it were, for describing the electrical and mechanical environments, uh, for E3, it has uh, 10, to 10 uh, dB or more of additional outside noise that could be coupled to the cable, which puts an additional strain on the pairs and the electronics attached to the cable to decipher the, uh, the signal. Of course, coupling of outside noise is affected by proximity to the cable and, of course, the length. And one of the things we're trying to explore is the effect of the length and the proximity as well, because sometimes there's noise that come across the entire channel, and sometimes there's locally induced noise. And of course, UTP cables by nature do not have the advantage of screening attenuation, and so improved levels of pair balance are being proposed and implemented in various uh, various standards and PA and otherwise. Uh, so we wanted to see how the uh, pair balance uh, effect actually behaved in different type of scenarios compared to the typical laboratory environment. So we also looked into spectral density of the, and the temporal factors in the interfering signal as well because we believe that um, different types of signals would have different uh, amounts of impact on the Ethernet traffic. So again, we have growing importance of electrical interference. We have more critical applications. Uh, we're also going to talk about the summary of cable constructions that are being tested, the various constructions and how they were put together and, and the constructions overall. We're going to talk about the uh, EMC testing results and uh, some of the differences and similarities we saw to conventional uh, testing processes. 
We're going to talk about both the RFI and EFT, and also about the differential and common mode voltages we measure on the cable and how they differ. We're also going to talk about the effects on Ethernet throughput with these various signals. And we're going to conclude, of course, with the observations and conclusions. So signal integrity with induced electrical noise. You know, these uh, Cat5 and 6 uh, gigabit type uh, applications are continuing to expand into different environments. And there's just more opportunities in, for cables to be installed near or within electrically adverse environments. At the same time, many of these new applications, particularly industrial and some others, uh, they require a, a re reasonably deterministic data flow and really rely on essentially real-time communication. So disruptions in the data channel and data link, even though temporary, temporary, could really cause some difficulty in the channel operation for the application. So again, these short responses, retries, short link loss, et cetera, can have a significant impact on the operation of the channel. And gigabit is also expected to remain a significant portion of the existing and new Ethernet applications, even if uh, data rates of 2.5 and, and 5 and 10 continue to grow market share. So the constructions that were tested was one was a Category 5B, a very conventional four-pair UTC construction. The other was a Category 6, again, conventional four-pair UTC. We also tested a Category 6A cable, uh, again, rated to uh, 10 gigabit, but tested in this gigabit application as well. We also did two barrier designs, which is a conventional core surrounded by a barrier layer. Uh, we call this uh, first cable design A with a barrier layer and cable design B with a different barrier layer. And one of the purposes of this investigation and testing was to determine any differences, if any, between these two cable designs. The test itself was uh, conducted the RF, with uh, RF immunity, and this is a radiated immunity type testing based on IEC standards. And you see here the, um, the, the test frame in the, um, in the EMC chamber and, um, and how the cable is arranged on a dielectric test frame and within the uh, uh, essentially the calibrated plane of the antenna in the test chamber. So the testing was done uh, uh, with a 20 to megahertz frequency range, which uh, reasonably matched the density for gigabit Ethernet. The frequency that, that was impinged on the cable was a continuous, con continuous wave, or CW, and we held the frequency for a few seconds and then changed on to the next frequency. And there were 29 frequency steps in the RFI uh, interference and uh, 5 megahertz change at uh, each hold period. So these steps that you're, you, I'm mentioning now, you will see these steps in the data charts that are going to follow. The field strength was 3 volts a meter to match the guidelines with MICE categories. And of course, as I mentioned, the test frame was in the calibration frame, frame and uh, based and the testing based on IEC 61000-4-3. And about 30 meters of cable was in the calibration plane on the test frame. And the cable was attached to spectrum analyzers, which uh, measured the coupled pair voltage uh, in the cable. And for differential measurements, the pair was attached to a ballon and also attached then to the spectrum analyzer. So this is a chart uh, that uh, has on the horizontal scale the frequency ranging from 20 to 150, 60 megahertz. And on the vertical scale is the induced pair voltage in common mode and expressed as dB microvolts. So what you see here are the, the uh, the five cables uh, cables plotted, uh, and one thing is striking, and that is that when you look at this chart, you see that the uh, the three UTP cables uh, tend to reside sort of in the middle of this chart, and I would I would say looks more similar than different as far as the overall coupling strength to the cable pairs. 
What was interesting is that the two barrier designs had a distinctly different amount of coupling to the uh, cable pairs. So cable barrier A actually has, seemed to have a bit more coupling of common load energy to the pairs, where barrier design B had much less coupling. That was different as much as 40 dB. So this was a striking uh, uh, result here, we thought, where the uh, the differences were very pronounced in the barrier design, and uh, also, somewhat as expected, uh, the uh, effects of common mode coupling across the different categories, all the way from 5E to category 6, were reasonably similar. So then uh, we've also measured the uh, differential voltage on this cable, again, using a ballon on the pair rather than measuring the, pair, the conductor voltages directly. And we also saw uh, an interesting uh, variation within the, within the uh, results, also showing that the three cables um, that were conventional UTP tended to group together sort of in the middle of the chart. And then you also see that barrier A, because of the higher common mode voltage, also had a higher differential mode voltage. And uh, the barrier um, B uh, exhibited a much lower differential vo mode voltage, which would be expected based upon the lower common mode voltage coupling. So one of the things that was done then was to try to understand um, the effect of the pair balance within the test setup. Uh, and so what we did is we measured the, uh, the, uh, the, two, the two voltages and actually did math to understand the, uh, the, sex, the, the balance, which is uh, the, the, the subtracting the differential and common load voltages to come up with what would call, we call a parent balance in this test. So what we find is that although the, some designs couple more than others as far as energy, it was uh, interesting to see that the apparent balance, which is the difference of common mode and differential mode coupling, was more similar among all the cable designs, which is reasonably consistent with actually uh, the test results we saw in the laboratory. This is the uh, pair balance or uh, testing that was done in the laboratory, uh, rather than the uh, the conventional TIA 568 type test for TCL rather than the EMC chamber. And so what we did do was he smoothed the data to try to get a better sense of the trend line rather than, because this, this data can be kind of noisy and bounce up and down. So you see the various trends there. There are some differences in the height uh, and the and magnitude of the various uh, tests that we did. But overall, I'd say looking at the, the scale and the differences we see in the amount of voltage coupling, it's more similar than different, although there are some some, some difference of the cable to cable. Moving on to EFT testing, um, this was an interesting test that uh, we did because of several reasons. Um, of course, it's based on this IEC 61000-4-4 uh, test procedure which it specifies the, the arrangement, it specifies the fixture that you see in which the cable is placed, and uh, it provides a guideline for, for such testing. Uh, the, um, the fixture that you're looking at is one meter in length, so what's unusual, not unusual, what's different about this test compared to the EMC, to the RFI test is that the noise is both coupled and along a very short distance, and also coupled uh, very close to the cable as well. So the proximity of the noise to the uh, uh, to the cable is, is very uh, is very close. And then this test, uh, the standard type test that measures that it applies a, um, a thousand volt spark, uh, either positive or negative polarity, and uh, then this spark, this spark was, uh, uh, the result of this was then captured on the pair of voltages. And of course, then the one meter cable was, was, was zapped, in, as it were, and we measured the pair of voltages that was induced. And this chart 
we found interesting. So this is a voltage, a chart of the common load voltage for UTP type cables. Again, the horizontal axis is frequency ranging from 0 to 150 megahertz. The vertical scale is the amount of the induced voltage, common load voltage on the pairs. What we found was that essentially the coupling to all the cables was the same. So there could be a barrier, it could be a category 6A, it could be a, could be a category 5B with much, much different difference in lay lengths. And yet, in this particular test, we found the coupling was essentially the same across all the cable designs, which is interesting. And uh, we feel that you know, some of it may be induced, induced or caused by things like near field effects, which have a different coupling uh, uh, characteristics compared to more distant radio sources. So we also, it not listed in the in the list of cables, we were curious about, given this result, what would happen with a, a, a screen cable. So what we did find somewhat is expected, and that is even in this test with the spark voltages, et cetera, and the close coupling, we did see considerable difference between the screen and the UTP type cable. This particular chart is comparing a category six UTP and a category six FUTP. And you see that indeed there's quite a number of dB between 10, 20 dB, sometimes 30 dB of screening attenuation that results in this in this in this particular test configuration. So screening in this case does work and, and impact the amount of coupling where barriers and lay lengths and those kinds of things do not seem to affect the coupling to the cable. So then we did the uh, same test uh, in differential mode voltages, and we measured these uh, curves here. And this is a differential mode voltage. Again, the common mode, as you saw before, was very, very similar. Yet we did see differences in differential mode coupling. And kind of continuing the overall observation is that the two barrier designs seem to bookend the high and the low end of coupling and the UTP cables tended to reside somewhat in the middle. So this is an interesting result, particularly since the common loads were so similar, yet there were differences that came out uh, that were, I think, significant in the differential mode voltage coupling. We also did differential mode voltage on the screen cable just to see what, what it was doing and make verify. And again, we saw the significant reduction in differential mode voltage which matched the, different, the reduction in common mode and therefore the effectiveness of the screen cable design for minimizing noise on the cable from outside sources. So with screen cables, um, both common mode and differential modes are significantly reduced. And with UTP cables, um, it seems that improved pair balance can indeed reduce differential mode voltage. But interesting enough, it really has little or no effect on the amount of common mode voltage induced. And this, I think, has some various implications we'll discuss now and a little bit later as well. In particular, allowing a cable to have high levels of common mode voltage results in the other components of the channel also receiving that common mode voltage. So the voltage is inflicted on the connectivity and then most importantly is inflicted upon the, uh, the, the electronics at each end. So the electronics then get into, uh, 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 have a requirement of high common mode rejection in order to operate properly. And then this is a slide that is, uh, how do you say, commonly understood, but I thought it was worthwhile at least bringing this slide up, and that is that um, the screening attenuation of a cable really, in, a, in some ways, adds to the TCL uh, performance or the balance of the noise coupling. And of course, it's commonly understood that the coupling attenuation is a sum of screening and uh, balance attenuation in the cable. 
And so it's very typical for tables that are screened to have you know, 30 or 40 dB of screening attenuation. So in order to meet the same expectations in a UTP compared to screened cable, you're going to need you know, a good 20, 30 dB improvement in balance. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish in a UTP type cable. And so the, um, the screen cable, the, the overall balance or total balance, which could be equated with coupling attenuation, is, is a very strong performer compared to UTP uh, cables in an adverse electrical environment. We also tried to put this, uh, some of this in a more uh, organized fashion, as it were, where, or simplified fashion, I should say, where we try to understand is when we looked at the TCL re results in the, TI in the TIA standard activity testing, and we looked at the results in the ENC chamber, we were trying to understand <clears throat> was a cable better or worse than might be expected based upon the balance requirements or balance results, I should say. So what we see here is that when we stand back and look at the various charts, <clears throat> try to compensate for a laboratory balance and also observed balance the apparent balance in the in the test. We saw that uh, four of the five cables um, tended to um, group reasonably well together. There's four or five dB difference, um, but that seems to be reasonable with, for this particular test and the kind of variation we see. What did have our, um, come out is that the barrier B did seem to actually improve the overall performance of the cable in the aspect of noise immunity a bit more than might be expected by the differences in, in uh, pair balance. So there seems to be a, indeed an effect of different designs of barriers on cables that make some uh, perform differently in different environments. So to put, put this together, um, what we did was we put together the um, the, the testing situation, hooked a, a couple of computers up to the channel and measured data throughput. So we had an 80 meter length of cable and we had plugs at each end. There were no, uh, it was not a four connector channel, it was just uh, plugs at each end of the 80 meter cable plugged into the, uh, the network cards. We had a PC at each end and also what we thought was important was a bi-directional flow of data we generated the traffic. We did the RSI testing, <clears throat> which was continuous wave and, and based on past data, not too surprising. But what we found, which is important to note, we did not really see a lot of noticeable effect on the throughput. And meaning that when we subjected the cable to continuous wave interference, there was essentially no impact, if not no impact, on data, data, rate, data rate throughput. However, when we did the EAP testing, which is both a time-dependent and a broad spectrum interference, we did see visible throughput effects. So what you're looking at here is a time chart. On the horizontal scale is time in hours, minutes, seconds. You're looking at a chart of data throughput, both in download and upload. Uh, orange and blue charts, and, and mo most of the time they're very, very similar, so you cannot see both lines. And on the vertical scale is the data throughput in megabits per second. And as you can see, the data throughput goes from about 1,000 down to a lower number. So this is a typical result we, we saw in the EFT testing. So what you see here actually is in this chart, which is I think very significant to note, and that is that the test setup consisted of the test setup was um, um, four four pulses of energy, and we tested at a thousand volt sparks. So you see four dips in the in the data, and then we tested at 1250. We saw the dips, and we saw 1500, and saw the dips again. So what you're seeing is the 12 spark events separated by the time when there was no sparks at all where the data rate covered. So you see the data throughput fell during this time and improved and then came back during the uh, 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 time when there was no signal.
Now, what was interesting and I think very important as well from this paper is that we changed the system where we used identical net network cards at each end. We saw dramatically different responses to the data throughput. Sometimes you would see a sharp blip. Sometimes you would see no impact at all. So just by changing the NIC cards from different NIC cards on each end to the same NIC cards at each end, the results were dramatically different. So we have consistent, maybe some short two drops, and also what we notice is that the impact, in a way, seems to fade out with repeated pulse exposure. So the longer these cards were exposed to the noise, the more they seemed to maybe learn what was going on and, and compensate. So we see that Hitachi testing, we, we, the noise immunity is highly dependent upon the spectral density and time dependence of the interference. Um, the repeated interference can eventually or partially be canceled out after the DSP system adapts. So you can get uh, uh, essentially uh, no impact on your channel with an EFT test or I should say an RFI test, but it depends on what the spectral density to, on the effect of the uh, system. Systems are definitely more sensitive to random and rapidly changing interference. And of course, the system is highly dependent upon the specific combination of electronics in the system. So what we believe, and as a coming out of this paper, I think there's some data that tells us that voltage coupling on the pairs is a much more repeatable measure of cable and noise immunity compared to uh, network throughput type testing. The BER type tests are sometimes often as much of a test of electronics than they are on the cable, and doing such testing adds substantial variables to the test results. Now, BR type testing certainly is valuable to do and worthwhile and provide valuable feedback, but I think the repeatability of these testing really um, it requires a lot of effort to maintain. In fact, you know, continuously testing interference may actually overestimate the cable noise immunity. And again, the, the, the depends on the induced voltage and the pulse repetition rate, et cetera. So in conclusion, the screen cables do indeed offer improved immunity to interference. Some barrier designs offer improved immunity compared to U, uh, traditional UTP type designs. The voltage characteristics depend on the test condition and the length of cable subjected to the interference. In other words, coupling will change based on the proximity and the type of signals subjected on the cable. And common mode coupling is essentially unaffected by the design type of UTP cables and sometimes even with the barrier to layer within the cable. So the EFT testing is actually a much different coupling compared to, say, a dis more distant antenna type test. And the EFT cable differential, differential mode coupling, although the common mode is very similar, the differential mode does vary with the cable design. And reduction differ differential mode voltage on improved pair balance really has no effect on the coupled mode attenuation voltage. And thank you for listening. I do appreciate it. I'll turn this back to the moderator. Thank you, Ken. Uh, at this time, we will take as many questions from the attendees as time permits. Uh, starting with this first question, um, will higher category cable ratings, such as CAT7 or CAT8, require screening or shielding cable designs in the future to maintain signal integrity? Uh, the general answer is yes. Uh, those uh, higher categories, you have a very high requirement for crosstalk between pairs and uh, also between cables. And so generally speaking, the CAT7 type CAT8 cables are routinely uh, shielded pairs within an overall jacket. Okay, thank you. Next, um, with regard to the better performing cables, was the barrier a foil, shield, or some other crossweb or separator design? Uh, the crossweb design, the crosswebs were contained in the uh, category 6A type cable, even the, I think the CAT6 as well, and that was for internal crosstalk performance. Uh, the barrier designs were 
were a, a, a Hitachi design. There were two designs out there. I can't really go into the details right now, but there were two different types of designs made by Hitachi, uh, specifically and differently, uh, differently designed to understand the difference in performance. Okay, next. Um, were the barriers applied to individual pairs or as an overall barrier over the four pair core, uh, such as under the cable jacket? Yes, the, the barrier, the, the cables with barriers were, you might say, a more conventional UTP type core with or without a, a dielectric cross web. And then there was a barrier applied over the core itself, which provided the, um, the intended uh, isolation of the cable core from the outside environment. Thank you. Are, are these cable designs for internal plenum cable applications? If so, are the electrical interference concerns or conditions due to indoor industrial or power cable installation environments? These cables uh, could be applied. Uh, they're typically indoor type cables. They're structured cabling type designs. Uh, but that really is the concern we have in this testing is that um, um, a lot of interference on the cables can happen by passing across a uh, LED or for a fixture, uh, running by an electrical motor, particularly start-stop switches in an industrial environment can generate a lot of short-term high-energy high pulses. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the cable, cables and their typical applications we would be subjected to a wide range of interference. And, and a particular concern, or the investigation, I should say, was just how do these react to uh, specific, potentially reasonably strong, but very local um, uh, interference sources, which was somewhat mimicked and, and represented by the electrical fans transient testing, the EFT. Okay. I am taking no further questions, so thank you, Ken, at this time for presenting this very interesting and important topic today. Please note the contact points being shown should you wish to contact Ken after today's event. Each of these IWCS webinar series presentation events are recorded and will be archived on the IWCS.org website. It normally takes up to two weeks for these to be posted. The IWCS webinar series will conduct presentation events on a monthly basis. Webinar events will take place on the third Friday of each month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Our next scheduled webinar event will be on Friday, July 19th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior. Please feel free to share our announcements with your colleagues so that they can join in and register as well. For over 67 years, the IWCS International Cable and Connectivity Symposium has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies in cable and connectivity products, processes, and applications. Our next annual international conference will take place on Sunday, September 29th through Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019 at the Charlotte Convention Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. In addition, the third annual UL and IWCS China Cable and Connectivity Symposium will take place on Tuesday, March 17th through Thursday, March 19th, 2020 at the Marriott Hotel City Center in Shanghai, China. Please visit our website at iwcs.org for more event details. In just a moment, you will see a brief survey so that you can provide us your feedback and comments on today's event so that we can further improve this webinar series for you. Thank you for participating, and this concludes today's event.